Uh, I'm Katie McCaffrey. Uh, I'm a distributed systems engineer. That's my disco hoodie. I program in that sometimes. Um, so I work at the Twitters currently on infrastructure and platform, specifically observability. Um, and I just joined in January, and I live in San Francisco. Prior to that, though, I spent six, uh, six plus years working in the entertainment industry on games like Years of War 2 and 3. Um, and then Halo 4 is the one that I spent the bulk of my time on building like services and networking and distributed systems that essentially power a lot of the entertainment experiences that um, when you turn on your Xbox and start playing that you see. Um, so that's my Twitter and I have a tech blog. If you want to talk to me on the internet, I do that, so feel free. Okay, so like I said, I worked at Halo. I joined in 2010 when uh, 343 Industries was a studio created inside of Microsoft to take over the Halo franchise from Bungie, who decided they want to go make other games, and they just made Destiny, right? So I was like web service dev number two, hired in this tiny studio at like 30 people to figure out what we were going to do with this old Halo stack. Because the, uh, the original games had services. There was like Halo 1, 2, 3, and then Reach and ODST all had uh, additional services to help you play and experience the game. Uh, but they were, you know, the way we were used to building old services where you had the game talking to um, a static service that you could just like linearly scale out and then you had one giant SQL database that everything that housed the source of truth for all of like Halo, all of the Halo games. And so we realized that that wasn't going to scale for us when we looked at what we wanted to do for Halo 4 and the future of the franchise going forward. So like we knew or we actually hit numbers of 1.5 billion games for Halo 4 played. Uh, and then 11.6 million unique users. And so that wasn't going to fit on a single giant SQL database anymore. So we ended up going and rewriting all of the services and moving to um, Azure's cloud. And we ended up using Azure Table Store as our, uh, as, as our largest form of like NoSQL storage. And so that's a key value store for those of you who aren't familiar with it. Uh, and so now in this world, we had this challenge where we had used to do things with transactions on a single database. And so we were very used to programming against transactions on this giant database, and that kept our system consistent, and that was really nice. But now we no longer had this because all of our data was split across multiple partitions. So we decided, we thought really hard about how we wanted to do this. And for me, thinking really hard is generally like going to a bar and reading a bunch of papers and drinking bourbon. Um, but we came across the Saga pattern, which is a paper that was published in 1987. Um, that I'm going to tell you guys about. And we actually went and implemented that so that we could process statistics in sort of a transactional way. And I'm using it in quotations because we are giving up some things. If you saw Neha's talk, we do not have serializability. Um, but we are giving up some things, but it does give us a way to guarantee consistency like from the beginning to the end of the transaction and what to do in failure scenarios. So I'm going to talk to you guys today about sagas, um, give you a little bit of motivation for why we need them. Um, and then we'll talk about the original paper um, its contribution to the distributed or to the database space because it actually came out of the database community, and then we'll talk about how you do this in a distributed world because it is a little bit different. Um, there are additional challenges and constraints that you need to impose, and then we'll talk about how we actually did this in Halo 4. Okay, so right, like our systems used to be really simple. We used to be able to have like an app or a website that talked to a stateless service that talked to this giant canonical database source of truth, and so you got transactions, you got serializability and ACID. So, right, serializability is our guarantee that things look like they sort of happen sequentially. Um, atomicity is this idea that it either all happened or it didn't, and we do not see uh, the state of things being processed in between. Consistency is application level consistency. It's not linearizability consistency, but it's basically that our system is still in a valid state after we have, uh, uh, when we've started the transaction and at the end of the transaction, the system is in a valid state and that um, it either like totally, whether the transaction completed or did not. Um, isolation is that these uh, transactions do not affect each other if they are running concurrently. Um, and then durability is this idea that once we've committed something, it persists and is long lived and like we don't lose data. So right, but now we're in this world where we have service-oriented architectures and microservices, and we don't have canonical sources of truth anymore. Um, often when we are writing applications, we are in interacting with maybe some of our own APIs, or we are interacting with someone else's APIs um, and using them. And so we, we actually cannot, and they all have their own backing stores, right? So there is no like one canonical source of truth. We don't get transactions anymore. We just can't have them. Um, and so some ways that we've tried to solve the distributed transaction problem is two-phase commit. So two-phase commit is an atomic commitment protocol. Um, and basically, it's a specialized version of consensus protocol. So sometimes 
it's like okay and it's been implemented and done at small scale and basically I'm gonna go very quickly through it but you have a prepare phase where you'll have a single coordinator. The coordinator is very special in the system. He's a single point of failure. Um, and he'll propose to all of the resources involved, hey, we're gonna go do this thing. And then all the resources get to vote, yes, I wanna do this thing, or no, I do not wanna do this thing. And the coordinator collects all of the votes. So once the coordinator has received all of the votes, uh, we now enter the commit phase. And if everyone has said yes, then we say go and do the transaction, commit, and so that is how they achieve atomicity, because everyone is committing at the same time. Um, or if anyone says no, then they say don't do it, right? So there's no like uh, state where you could have the car reserved and not have the hotel reserved in your travel app. Everyone at the end must say done in order in a real distributed system so that you can, the coordinator can know what has happened. So this is kind of nice and this is actually people use this, um, but it doesn't really scale all that well. Um, in failure conditions, you can have up to ON squared messages going through your system. Your coordinator is once again a single point of failure, so if that thing dies at any point during the transaction, like it's just aborted. Um, and so the more resources you have, the more latency there probably is, and you're bounded by the slowest resource in the system, and so therefore that coordinator has a larger chance of failing. And there's just sort of reduced throughput through your system because you're still like holding these locks on these resources as you're operating over them, and so that's kind of slow. Also, it's worth pointing out that none of the large cloud providers implement two-phase commit protocol, and they actually specifically say they don't. Like, Azure has a blog post on this because uh, it just doesn't scale well, and it's not something that they want you using in their system because they're worried about all of these things. Okay, and then Google has Spanner, right? This is how they do the, their distributed databases. This is also another paper that came out of Google. I highly recommend going and reading it. I'm gonna cover it briefly. Um, it also is a great point of challenging your notion of time because it doesn't really exist, <laughs> or we can't have one logical use of time. So Spanner is the way that Google does globally distributed databases um, and transactions between databases across the world. Um, and the way they sort of make all of this work is they have their true time API and they have um, GPS and atomic clocks installed in all the data centers. It's also worth pointing out that Google has fiber between all of their data centers, so they're not going over the network, like they're not going over the normal network that most of us use. Um, and so that's much faster. Um, and so what this true time API does is it takes all of the inputs from the system, which includes the GPS and the atomic clocks, and then it is able to calculate a bound of time when this event occurred, and so they use that to create a total ordering in the system. But they're only getting down to zero to seven milliseconds. Like, it's still not, synchronization is not a solved problem. They just get a really, really tiny window, and so it works pretty well. So, um, obviously, Google Spanner is not available to all of us. It is really expensive, and it's proprietary. So, um, right, distributed transactions is not, once again, solved for the masses, and it's really, you know, synchronization is not solved. So what I'm trying to get at here is that distributed transactions are really hard and they're really expensive, especially if you want serializability in ACID. So um, can we do better, right? Can we get distributed transactions with serializability in ACID? Well, I'm not a researcher. Um, I, I just build large-scale distributed systems. So right now, the answer is no. Um, we can't because of the cap harem and we can't have nice things and distributed systems are terrible, but it, we can start to give up some of these really tough constraints like serializability and ACID. If, what can we give up and still program in this model that we're used to and still ha build correct systems? So this is where sagas come in. Sagas is actually from the, or is from the database literature in 1987. Uh, it was published by Hector Garcia Molina and Kenneth Salem from Princeton University. And it's a paper that is looking at um, just like how do we uh, do long-lived transactions on a single database. So they, they came across this problem where if we're doing a transaction that consumes a lot of resources or runs for a really long time, like computing a, a, a bank statement or something that has to go through a large range of history, um, that creates a bottleneck on even just a single database because it's holding locks on a bunch of different resources as it's doing this. And so they, they wanted to maybe, they knew they couldn't get full ACID and serializability, but they're like, what can we do to make this faster um, and still get some guarantees? And so they came up with this concept of a saga, um, and they purposed this for long-lived transactions on a single database. So they define sagas as a long-lived transaction that can be written as a sequence of transactions, and these transactions can be interleaved with one another. All transactions in the sequence either complete successfully at the end of the saga, 
or compensating transactions are ran to amend partial execution. So let's break this down so it's a little bit uh, more understandable. Right? They said a saga is a collection of subtransactions. So you take whatever the large thing you want to do and you break it down into these little pieces of transactions. And these all transactions can have acid on a single database um, concerns. The one gotcha is they cannot like, depend on one another. So uh, you, that's the interleaving part. Like T1 cannot take, or T2 can't take an input from T1 and they, don't ha they can't have any ordering that is supposed to happen for them. So if you can break your work into sort of normal system, or into these things, then you have a, the start of a saga. Each transaction in the saga has a compensating transaction. And once again, the interleaving and the, um, the not being dependent on one, one another principle holds here as well. And the thing about these compensating transactions is that they're gonna semantically undo the transaction that they correspond to. And so the paper actually acknowledges that because um, we're dividing the work into these pieces, sometimes you can't, um, you can't return the system to the same state. If you execute a transaction and then you have to compensate for it, you may not be able to return it to the same state um, as it was before the transaction started. Like for instance, if you were gonna send an email, like one of your transactions was sending an email, you can't unsend that email, um, but you can send a follow-up email to say like, hey, this is what happened. Uh, and so like we're correcting it. And so it's sort of like this failure management pattern that we're doing. Okay, and then after we define all of this, we have this nice guarantee that either all of the transactions completed, so our saga was successful and like whatever unit of work we wanted to do has finished, um, or some of the transactions have completed and all of the compensating transactions have ran. So the saga failed, but we are now back to a semantically consistent state that we were before we started the saga. This is actually a really nice model to program against because it's very similar to transactions, right? Like we're either, we're keeping consistency and application correctness throughout our system. So what we did here, though, is we traded off atomicity um, for availability. These, so, these, um, these sub-transactions are going to execute independent of one another, and so you will see pieces of the saga completing before the whole saga has completed. And so if you need atomicity, this doesn't work for you, but for a lot of our applications, this is okay. And then I also really just like sagas as a whole because they're a failure management pattern. Um, and so building distributed systems, we should just plan for everything to fail, um, especially if you're in the cloud, especially if you don't like own your own networks. Even if you own your own networks, you should plan for everything to fail. And so forcing your application developers to think about failure as like the for first and foremost in your design pattern is gonna help you build more robust systems and it's gonna help you build more, um, like less fragile systems because you don't just code the golden path, right? You actually are having to think about like, well, what happens when we go off of the golden path? Okay, so how this works in a single database is if you were gonna do this, we were gonna have our travel application, uh, you would try and book a trip and instead of having this one large transaction that would try to reserve all of the things we needed to go on our trip, we would um, split it up into like these logical units of work like booking a hotel, booking a car, booking a flight, and then canceling all of those reservations in the case that the saga fails. The way this works in a single database is you have this process called the Saga Execution Coordinator, or the SEC. The SEC lives in process with your database, and so it sort of shares the same face. So we're not in a distributed world just yet. But um, his job is to go and execute these um, sub-transactions, and then in the case of failure, start applying compensating transactions. You also have a Saga log that is just like your normal database log, and so it's going to do things like, um, uh, you're gonna commit the messages to it like begin Saga, end Saga, abort Saga, and then all the beginning end commit messages for the transactions and compensating transactions. And so what this looks like as you're going through, um, just to give you an idea, is if a successful Saga would be like, I wanna book a trip, right? I'm gonna start my Saga in the log, I will start booking the hotel. At this point, I now own that hotel resource, the rest of the world can see this, right? We don't have atomicity. Um, I'll continue, I'll book the car, um, I'll end booking the car, that completed, I now have that car resource, and then finally, if I can get my flight, then I can go on my trip and we can say that we successfully completed this Saga. Um, What's also nice to note here is that uh, in your application, you can order things in, the, in like a risk-centric way. So like, right, sometimes there's penalties with canceling a flight. So maybe that's the last thing we wanna do because I don't wanna have to go and roll that back. So there is a, a, there is a reason I'm showing you the ordering in this way. Okay, so what happens when like things fail and things break, right? We have unsuccessful sagas and the paper actually discusses a couple different uh, failure modes. There's like backwards recovery and forwards recovery and a couple other ones. But I'm gonna talk about backwards recovery because I think it's the most common and the most useful. 
Um, and this is the idea that as soon as we have a failure or we can't complete a transaction or something happens, we just start rollback. Um, and we start applying our compensating transactions for anything that had been ran. So an unsuccessful saga will look like this in the log. We'll begin the saga. Maybe we start booking the hotel and that succeeds, so we own that reservation. Um, and then for whatever reason, booking the car will fail because maybe there wasn't um, an available rental car that day. So now we need to roll back and start applying compensating transactions. So you'll start to apply the compensating transactions. It will free any resources that happen to have been taken. Um, and then you'll free the hotel reservation as well. Um, and now we're back into semantically the same state. I'm sad because I don't get to go on my trip and I can try and rebook later. But um, right, like we are still in a consistent state for our application even though we like held on to that hotel resource for a brief period of time. Now someone else can go and take it. It's just like a normal transaction. So this isn't a single database, so it's the transaction, it's asset. It either completes successfully or it doesn't. Abort in a single database is like someone is canceling it. Okay, so SOG is in a distributed system. The paper actually comments on this, and it does my favorite thing that early database literature does, where they say, uh, due to space limitations, we only discuss it on a centralized system, although clearly it can be implemented in a distributed database. And I laughed, because this is my life. Um, so, so um, thanks Hector Garcia Molina. So we're actually gonna go through and implement this. There are blog posts and stuff written about this pattern, but I don't like any of them because I don't actually think they give you enough detail to implement the full guarantee. Um, so we're gonna talk about how you actually do that, why it's different in a distributed world, and some of the additional restrictions we have to apply in order to like get the same guarantee. So we're back to this world, right? We are no longer on one canonical database source of truth. We are probably operating with a bunch of services that are uh, holding on to different data, like using whatever data store they choose to use and applying their own constraints. Um, and so this sort of translates really nicely, right? We can still break the units of work into these like requests of book hotel, book car, book flight, and then the cancellation requests. So, so far so good. I'm gonna do a little term redefinition because I don't like using the word transaction in the distributed sense because it's not really a transaction. It's generally gonna be a request. It's also, um, Transaction applies ACID semantics to me, and you can get, like, these requests could be ACID if that service, like, gave you that guarantee, but it's really up to the service to define what guarantee you have here. So I, hopefully they give you, like, consistency and durability. You're probably not gonna get isolation or atomicity from any of these. Um, okay, maybe. Depends on what your API you're interacting with. So, and so you still have your sub-requests as well, right? They're gonna semantically undo the requests that are happening. So the successful distributed saga looks exactly the same, um, and we still have our log. We still need a log, but now it's not co-located with a database because we don't have a single database, so we have to have a durable and distributed log that lives somewhere, so this might be Kafka or Azure Service Bus or like whatever you want to use. Um, it just needs to function as a log. Um, you still need a saga execution coordinator. This is once again a process, and it doesn't live co-located with anything. Um, it's not special. I want to point out that this thing is not special. It is not like our coordinator in two-phase commit. It can die. It has no state. It doesn't do anything special. All of our source of truth is still in that log. So the SOG execution coordinator is this process that's going to interpret and write to SOGA logs. It'll apply our SOGA sub-requests, and then in the case of failure, it'll decide when it needs to start applying compensating requests. So let's walk through what this looks like because things are a little different now. Um, I'll have our service that will commit a message to our Saga log to say I want to start a Saga, a large unit of work. It can commit a bunch of data to this log. These are not just like start and commit messages now. They can commit everything that I need to know to process this request. Um, a Saga execution coordinator can be spun up or will be there to see that I need to start processing this Saga. And, um, and then it'll start um, reading the Saga and figuring out what it needs to do. It'll first start by committing a message to the log that says I'm gonna do the first request in the saga, and that has to commit successfully before it can do anything else. It's then going to send a request to the service responsible for handling that, and then once that responds, it will commit a, a, that I finish the saga message to the log. So I walked through this fairly slowly to show you that now we have like four additional points of failure that we did not have when we were on a single database where everything was co-located and like essentially if it crashed, every, the SEC, the log, and all of these like transactions shared the same fate. Um, so we have a, a bunch of places where things can now fail again. So we'll walk through, like it sort of does the same thing. It'll commit the message to the log for the, the second request and then it will make the request. 
Uh, it will receive the response and then it will commit the message to the log. And then the same with the third. It'll commit the message, send the request, receive a response, and end the saga. So this is a successful saga and it still sort of all works the same and like life is good. So what happens when things fail? When do we need to start applying these compensating requests, right? Um, we still can have this idea of an aborted saga response, like the services could say, no, I'm not gonna do this thing for you because I just can't. Um, or they could say, like, I'm not available as a service. Um, or they could say things like, you don't have access to do this. Um, these start requests fail, right? So this could be like, whatever, HTTP or failure response, it throws a service, it's not there. And then in some cases, if that SEC crashes, we might have to start compensating actions. Because these requests, we have not applied any additional constraints on. They're, they don't have to be unimpotent. Um, there's nothing special about them. You can do whatever you want with them. And we'll talk more about the SEC crashes in a second. So what happens here, let's walk through like a failure case. So we've done the first thing. We've attained whatever uh, the first request is successfully. I've now started the second request and the service says, no, I'm not gonna do this. I want you to abort the saga or it gets a failure message and the SEC will then commit an abort saga message to the log. Um, so now we know that we're in rollback, right? Uh, we need to start applying the compensating transactions or requests, sorry. Um, so what it will do is it'll do the same thing like it's replying the regular request. It will commit the start message to the log. It will send the start compensating request to the service. It will hopefully succeed and then it will commit the message to the log. And then the same thing with um, the third one because it, it's just reading the log to understand that like, oh, I still have to apply the compensating request for um, service one as well. So that's great. And now we still sort of have the same kind of a guarantee we had. But what if compensating requests fail, right? Now we're in this world where they're, where they're not transactional. What if they fail? Um, so because they can fail, we need to be able to retry them indefinitely until they succeed. And so this imposes an extra constraint that we didn't have in the database world on our system, which our compensating requests have to be idempotent. I have to be able to replay them until they, they succeed. Um, so this is a little bit different than in the, in the normal single database case. Okay, and then finally what happens when our SEC fails? Like I've said, this guy isn't, this, this like process is not special. We can just spin up another one to continue whatever happens. Like it doesn't even have to be on the same machine. Um, we have to determine whether the SEC was in a, or the saga was in a safe state when the SEC crashed it or not. And so a safe state is that all the sub requests are complete. So you have the start and end both logged because at that point we know like, we know what happened. We just left off somewhere. Um, and we can just continue picking up with the saga wherever it left off. Um, and then if you're in an aborted state because compensating requests are uh, idempotent, we know we can just keep replaying them. Even if I've committed a start one, I just send it again. And so that's a safe state as well. Where we have to start applying rollback is when we get into this case of uncertainty of, uh, is, did we start a request and we don't have the end request logged? Because I don't know if it crashed before I even sent the request. I don't know if it crashed because it got a response back and then crashed. Like, I don't know the state of like whether the service even saw this, but it's not safe to replay that request because we haven't put any additional constraints on them. If in your system you can also make your normal request item potent, you can just, you never have to worry about SEC recovery. Like, you just bring it back up and start reprocessing. Um, but I think like making all requests item potent is a tall order to impose on like your normal method of execution. Um, and so what happens is you just commit an abort saga message to the log if you, if the SEC comes back up in an unsafe state, and you start the compensating requests. Okay, so essentially what we've done here, we have to define some request messaging semantics uh, on, top of, on top of like these requests that we're gonna define in a saga. Our sub requests are at most once, they will get delivered uh, zero or one time, and then our compensating requests are at least once, so they will get delivered at least one or more time in the system. And so that's, you need to know that when you're designing your saga to make sure that the systems that you're making these requests on can handle that. But now we're back at this world where we have the same saga guarantee that we did in the single database, and that's really great, right? Because now I know that either my whole saga has completed, um, and I'm in a semantically consistent state for my application, or my whole saga has not completed, and I'm still in a semantically consistent state for my application. And so that's a big win to be able to program with these bounds. Okay, so just to sort of recap distributed sagas, they're very similar to the single one, except for now you need a distributed durable saga log, and you can use whatever thing you like. Uh, you need an SEC process, he's not special, but you do need something that will like continually spin it up and make sure that it's running. And then you need these compensating, your compensating requests now have to be out impotent. So that's, that's different, but I think it, that's okay. And I don't think that's too tall of an order for us as application developers because 
like if you think about like RESTful services, um, like post is not, or like delete is idempotent, right? Or semantically is supposed to be idempotent. Okay, so let's go back to this guy. This is the Master Chief. Uh, he's the main character of the Halo series in Halo 4. And like I said before, uh, when we started looking at how to move from the single database world into this multi-partitioned like partitioned world of Azure NoSQL, uh, we ran into some problems. So I'm gonna talk about the statistics service. That's the main service in Halo that controls everything about your player. Um, I wrote the majority of this service. Um, and so it, it, we have very, very detailed analytics on what you're doing sort of at all times in the game. And so we do this by getting a giant um, blob of data uploaded to us at the end of every game and sometimes while you're playing. And so um, one of the problems that we ran into the system was that people care a lot about these statistics. Like they get really, really upset when you screw them up. Um, and it's always the best game they've ever had, always, shockingly. Um, and so, so and, and I mean, like, because like, right, e-gaming is a thing. People play game, like Halo for money and competition and prize money, and then people like to shit talk with their friends. So, and then they also like, ha like we have this whole website um, that you can go and like deep dive through, and this is just like a fraction of what we have per player. So, um, w some things to know about the statistics service is that we, you could have one to 32 players per game. Uh, all of our player data when we did this migration to um, fully cloud and, and um, storage as a service was uh, on Azure Table, which is a key value store. And each player in, in the key value store had their own partition. And so now you could, you're talking about running data to maybe 32 partitions, and it still sort of has to look like one unit of work and either all succeed or all fail. So we were you know, a little like stumped, but Sagas came in and helped us do this. So this is, um, if you've seen any of my Halo talks before where I talk about Orleans, this is what I normally show. Um, so we built uh, the bulk of the services using a, a MSR actor framework called Orleans. It's not super integral to this, but the little diamonds are actors or grains from Orleans. Um, and so what happens is the Xbox will send us a bunch of statistics, um, the game actor or like process, you can think of it like that if you're not familiar with the actor model, we'll like aggregate those, write it to blob storage, and then at the end we'll say, hey, all the players, please go update your statistics. And then all of those players will write to their corresponding partition in Azure Table Storage. And then I do this hand wavy song and dance where I'm like, it doesn't fail, just like there's a way to deal with failure. Um, and so this is actually what it looks like because it can fail. And so what actually happened is we had our Xbox um, writing to our stateless front end service that we wrote in F Sharp, um, which would then log a message to Azure Service Bus, which is a service, uh, it's a queuing service and message broker um, in Azure that you can use. And it would commit the payload of stats to um, the service bus and like, hey, like go start the saga for this game. So that was like, that's what we used as our saga log. Um, we had these router grains, these stateless router workers that would just notice that like, hey, something had got it committed and so we need to spin someone up to go and, and process this work. And we treated our, our, um, our game actors or our game processes like our SEC coordinator. So all the routers did is they just noticed that like new work was there and then they would spin up the right, the right game grain to go and handle it. So the game grain then acted like the SEC at this point and it would you know, do the whole like send all the messages and then commit back to the Azure, so uh, Azure service bus log. So what happened in failure, right? In failure, you maybe don't want to just roll back statistics, right? Because if I've committed your statistics and you can see them, even though your friend can't, and then I roll them back, that looks really jarring to say like, oh, you have 100 kills and now you have like 98 kills. That's a really bad user experience. Um, also, we just wanted to process this eventually anyway. It's not like we were gonna throw that data away if we failed to write for one player. So we implemented forward recovery, which is another pattern specified in the Saga paper, which just basically says this Saga like always needs to succeed, so just recover forward, right? Like don't roll back. And so the, the basic premise here is you checkpoint and you say when am I at a safe state um, you checkpoint these safe states, and if uh, you have a failure, you roll back to the safe state, and then you roll forward. Luckily for us, uh, any player succeeding on writing was essentially a safe state. We didn't have to do any rollback. So we would just retry the saga later if someone failed to write, and I'll sort of walk you through what that looked like. Right, so we had our game grain, which is our SEC. He talked to all of the players. Um, and the players talk to all of their own partitions. And so say like player three couldn't write to its partition because we blew our IOPS budget on that storage account or something, I don't know. And so like three of the players will now be able to see their statistics for that game on Halo Waypoint and player three will not. 
Um, and that's okay. We, like, people knew that our statistics processing was somewhat asynchronous. Generally, Halo players are a little narcissistic, so they weren't looking at their friend's stats, they were looking more at their stats. So um, we actually like, never had complaints about this. So that was fine. Um, and so we would then have to go and replay throughout the system. We would have to go replay layer player three, right? So we would actually put the, st the uh, message on and like back off on processing this for a while to give the system a chance to catch up because you don't just want to like hammer your storage account again if it's already like saturated. So, but because of this, if you're noticing, I'm not rolling back and I'm actually replaying um, the request to play her through again. And because uh, the, great, the game grain didn't know where that failed, it didn't know if it wrote and then like just failed to like get it back or like what had happened. And so, uh, so forward requests, or if you're going to do forward recovery in your system, in a distributed system, uh, then the sub requests also have to be item potent. So we were able to do some nice little tricks and rely on our database's consistency. Um, to ensure that we weren't like double counting statistics or everything. All of our requests were potent. Because it was essentially just set operations anyway, because you're just like adding like requests. So then when the saga got retried later in forward recovery, the game grain would send it to uh, our stats grain, player three, he would successfully store his statistics, and now we know we've processed all of the data in, in this game, and then we can just sort of like, we would discard it. We didn't actually have like a persistent log of everything, because that wasn't useful to us. We actually stored the data we needed and then threw it away. Um, and so at this point, we now had that guarantee that like all of the players in the, in the game had processed their statistics, and our system was in a consistent state and everyone could see their sta the statistics for the game. Cool. So I'm lying a little bit about this. What we actually did, and this is where I like to come in and tune systems, is uh, there's a trade-off here, right? If, if you're going to write for 32 players back to the Azure Service Bus log, um, which has to be consistent, right? There's a little bit of C uh, consistency. You're having a CP log, hopefully, because you don't want to just like drop data or like have errors in there. That's like kind of expensive to talk to that thing 32 times per game. So we optimized for our failure case because writing this to a single partition was not expensive because players were only doing that like once every 20 minutes when they had finished a game. And so for us, it was easier to just retry. It was a better uh, trade-off, network latency and all things considered wise, to just retry everything because we knew we were right impotent. Um, so that's a trade-off you can make. So when we would have a failure and we would forward recovery, we would actually just like re-blast everyone and say process your statistics. And the ones that um, already had them wouldn't double count and restore. They would just say, hey, I processed this correctly, and we were done. Um, so I like to point this out because I think as an industry we hide a little bit like some of the shortcuts we take, but I think it's actually really valid to take these shortcuts when you want to tune a very bespoke instance of a system. Like this is a very like one-off instance. You could go build a general saga distributed distributed saga execution coordinator and system, but like you can also just go and build one that works for your system and that's totally valid. This is a pattern for you to utilize in building your applications and making sure that they are correct. So just to sort of recap, right? Um, sagas are these long-lived distributed transactions, and you should use them in your system because I think they're a really helpful way to think and design and program against in a model that we're used to programming against. Um, you are trading off atomicity for availability, so if you cannot tolerate seeing partial execution of the thing happening in the saga, then you can't do this. But in most cases, we can do this, right? And then we can take corrective actions. Um, I build a, like uh, my skew in the world is towards highly available systems, right? Games. Um, social media, stuff like that. Uh, there's a very real world business consequence to us not being able to take actions and do things. Like if you can't play Halo, then that affects the amount of money that we make, and so that's bad. Um, so like making this trade-off is, is fine for us, and we, if we had to take corrective actions, we were gonna go do this. Um, and then finally, it's a failure management pattern, right? Like it helps you build more reliable and robust systems um, and less fragile systems. And so I like this as a, as a pattern in a whole because of that. Finally, I want to thank a bunch of people who helped me out with this talk. Peter Bayless, Ina Sombra, Tom Santero, Kyle Kingsbury, Jeff Hodges, and Clemens Vassers. Without them, I could not have done this. Um, and now, if you guys have questions, I'm happy to take them. <laughs>